Okay, uh, welcome everyone um, to the uh, 10th annual <clears throat> Peter Yazzie uh, Distinguished Lecture on Intellectual Property uh, here at American University Washington College of Law brought to you by the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property. We are delighted that you're able to join us uh, for this wonderful lecture by uh, Professor Sonia Katyal who we'll be hearing about soon. Um, a few uh, preliminary um, things. Uh, American University Washington College of Law acknowledges that although we are not gathered here today in, in, in physical space together, nonetheless, our, our physical plant at American University resides on the traditional homelands of the Nkotchdik uh, people uh, who, and who served as stewards of the region for generations. Um, and we want to make sure uh, that we acknowledge that. Um, we, we we were not able to be joined by our new dean Roger Fairfax, but he he def, def, definitely wanted to be with us, and he graciously recorded a, a welcome message that we're going to ask our AV folks to play right now uh, to kick us off. So Ryan, if you could do that, please. Greetings, my name is Roger Fairfax and I'm the Dean of the American University Washington College of Law. I am so sorry that I cannot be there with you on the Zoom live, but I wanted to take a brief moment to acknowledge our wonderful program on information justice and intellectual property. PIDGIP has been one of the leading strengths of WCL for many, many years. Our intellectual property program has consistently ranked in the top 10 and is currently ranked number eight by US News and World Report, and it gets an A-plus grade from Juris Magazine. The continued success of the IP program and the Glushko Samuelson IP Clinic builds on the four decades of service Professor Yazzie gave to the law school as a member of the full-time faculty, a service that he continues to render in his ongoing work with the program. I'm delighted to be here with you on the screen to celebrate the 10th anniversary of this distinguished lecture named in honor of Professor Yazzie's wonderful service to the Washington College of Law. So thank you for being here and enjoy the lecture. Thank you, Dean Fairfax. That's a great way to get us started. Um, so it's now my honor to uh, introduce our honoree, uh, Professor Yazi, um, who is going to uh, give us a remark or two about this 10th anniversary. Um, and, uh, and, and as the Dean said, um, the program, which has grown substantially over uh, the last couple decade and a half or so, really does uh, continue the work that Professor Yazi started. Um, his accomplishments are too numerous to mention, but um, among others, uh, as a scholar and a teacher, um, someone who uh, focused attention on the role of the romantic author in American copyright law, uh, an expert in international copyright law, um, uh, one of two collaborators on uh, impactful best practices in fair use across a range of practice communities, uh, and so much more. He continues to work with us on some of our externally supported uh, programs in, in involving the relationship between fair use and open licenses, um, and so much more. We, we continue to benefit from Peter's presence in the program. Uh, and so, Peter, congratulations. I can't believe it's 10 years, but, you know, when you're having a good time, time flies. Um, uh, and, and, and we've enjoyed and learned so much through this lecture series. And so uh, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Mike. That's very, very kind. And, and thanks also to, to Dean Fairfax for his extremely generous words. And thanks to all of you, and I do mean all, it's quite a list, for joining us this evening. Uh, looking over the, the prospective attendees, I've seen the names of some regulars who've been with us every year or almost every year for a decade, and also others who are, are new to the occasion, and I hope will we'll enjoy it enough to want to come back in, in future years. I want to begin on a, on a personal note. Um, as I've said often enough before in these, in these responses, my 
my colleague's very generous decision to, to name this event for me is a continuing source of both intense pride and, and, and some embarrassment. And without parsing all the reasons for the, the latter, I'll mention one that, that may not be obvious. And that is that for whatever reason, neither, neither my grandfather nor my father, I've spoken about both of them in, in past years, had a middle name. And I've always been a bit uncomfortable about the notion of middle names for this reason, and, and a little uncomfortable about seeing my middle name referenced. It, 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 it feels, I don't know, pretentious. But for whatever reason, it got into the lecture title. And for a couple of years, I, I considered asking that it be removed. And then I decided against it because the, the anomalous ish initial represents another member of my family who I would like to uh, acknowledge since he is, he is part of our, our familial academic tradition. And that's my, my uncle, Andrew Yassi, who taught German literature and aesthetic philosophy at Berkeley from 1948 to 1981. He was a lovely person, a considerable scholar, and by, by various accounts, an inspiring teacher. And these days, it gives me no little pleasure to think of my daughter, who studies in the Slavic department ensconced on the sixth floor of Dwinell Hall, just one flight of stairs up from his old office on the fifth. I think as a, a very deep-dyed academic, Andrew Yassi, would have appreciated the honor that has been conferred on me. So the, the, the initial stays in the picture, let's just say that. Um, since this is our, our 10th anniversary, I went over the, the impressive list of speakers, uh, save only for the, the, the choice of 2016, Who've, who've taken this podium over the years, and I won't, I won't uh, re read it out loud, but I do think that I would like to take a little time just to summarize each of these talks before I hand the mic over. That was a joke. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on past triumphs, although I will point out that there is a fascinating continuity between the lecture of last year, um, in which Suzanne Sean Harjo talked about uh, the, the long Native American struggle for dignity and respect, and tonight's topic that, that Professor Katyal will, will offer us in a moment. As I looked at all of those names, though, it did occur to me that, that the men and women on it have, have something in common in, in that their, their exemplary careers remind us, I think, of, of why we do this work, of why we, we go to the office or get on Zoom or, or, or haul ourselves back into the library day after day, week after week, to study the law of intellectual property. And it's not, I think, mainly because it provides such a kind of joyful mental workout because the problems are hard and interesting and fun to think about, although all of that is true. And I don't think it's mainly because the, the doctrines of IP and cognate bodies of law are important to the resolution of many high value private disputes, although they certainly are. It is, I think, what, what brings us back, what, what, what has kept the, 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 the experts on that list and all of us engaged with this subject year after year and decade after decade is, is something to else, else. And I think it's this. I think it is that more than any other body of law, and I would include in that, and we can explore uh, later today, the proposition that I offer, I would include in that the, 
the law of the First Amendment. I would suggest that on a day-to-day -day level, IP does more than any other set of legal doctrines to regulate our common discourse, including how we speak with one another about our enthusiasms and antipathies, how we communicate both information and misinformation, and about the ways in which we represent ourselves to others and in which others are in turn represented. So all of the past outside speakers have been experts who in one way or another don't just study their subjects, but actually seek to, to move them, to engage with them. And tonight's speaker, um, forgive the cat, um, joins this distinguished procession of engaged scholars. And I look forward to, to listening and learning along with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That was that was lovely. And uh, I'd also like to say congratulations on uh, on this 10 year anniversary. We are we are so thrilled um, to celebrate it with you and to invite uh, this year's speaker. Um, we are I, 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 I am honored to give the introduction, but I can hardly wait to get through my introduction to hear from the speaker. Um, but I just want to point out first that I feel so privileged um, to be sandwiched in between Peter and Sonia, two of the leading lights in intellectual property, two people who have inspired me so much. Um, so I'm I'm looking at myself on the screen and I'm literally sandwiched between the, the two the two squares, but to, to have this role just to speak between the two of them uh, is a delight. And so it is my honor to introduce um, this year's speaker, speaker Sonia Katyal, who is a professor at Berkeley Law School, um, who holds um, the distinguished Haas chair um, and also has the title of Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Research, as well as co-director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. Uh, Sonia teaches intellectual property law, regularly teaches intellectual property law, uh, property law and law and sexuality. And she writes in the areas of intellectual property, technology, civil rights, and the intersection of all three. Um, she's recently been writing some very exciting stuff. I was, I was just um, so excited to hear from all the work she's been recently doing, which she would choose to share with us tonight. Um, she's been writing about artificial intelligence, um, and she's got a, a, some recent work looking at how AI is involved in the creation and selection of trademarks, um, the right to information um, and source code secrecy. Um, she's uh, 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 been writing about um, the weaponization of trade secrets law outside of the commercial context. And of course, um, she's been writing about the reappropriation of disparaging trademarks. Uh, her scholarship has received numerous awards, including uh, being named honorable mention in the Association for uh, American Law School Scholarly Papers Competition, uh, the Yale Cybercrime Award, and she's twice won uh, the Duke Minier Award um, from UCLA. Um, and her recent article on source code secrecy has been selected for the best IP articles of 2019. Um, she uh, has written uh, books, is currently writing books, um, and has written uh, numerous articles, far too many uh, for me to mention. But in addition to her scholarly work, um, Sonia is one of those academics who writes things um, at, at a very deep and high level and also often translates that um, to larger audiences and has frequently published essays and opinions in major newspapers um, and magazines and, um, and, and that work has been cited uh, by the Supreme Court of the United States. Before she, uh, while she was an academic, um, she was 
um, in the Obama administration, selected to serve on the inaugural Digital Economy uh, Board of Advisors in the Department of Commerce. Um, and uh, although she's teaching now at Berkeley, she has also uh, spent um, the first part of her academic career teaching at Fordham Law School. And before teaching, um, she practiced law as an IP litigator in the San Francisco office of Covington and Burling. Um, she also has been a, a clerk for Judge Moreno in the Central District of California uh, and Judge Nelson in the Ninth Circuit. Um, and I could go on and on, but I do want to say um, before I pass the microphone over to uh, Sonia, um, that in addition to all of these amazing credentials and accomplishments, um, it has been such a pleasure um, to know Sonia and to know her work and to follow her um, because Sonia is really in a category of her own in terms of the, the level of thoughtfulness and creativity um, in, and interdisciplinarity that she brings to intellectual property law. Um, and on top of all of that, she is just one of the most lovely, kind, good people. Um, so it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's just <laughs> delightful that, that all of these qualities come together in Sonia. And so I'm very happy to present to this wonderful audience our uh, speaker uh, this year, uh, Professor Sonia Katya. Oh my gosh, wow, thank you so much. Um, my gosh, it's it's just such an honor uh, to be here um, uh, virtually with all of you on Zoom uh, as, as it turns out. Um, and uh, I just really wanna thank all of you so much and all of those that are joining us uh, on Zoom from so many different places. Um, and I just really wanna thank Peter and the folks at American for inviting me to be here today. Um, uh, and to join this incredible line of scholars who have given this lecture over the last 10 years. Um, and I, you know, I, I really just, I, I would like to dedicate this uh, lecture to the people that have spoken before me um, because uh, this lecture very much draws on the work of our previous lectures. And I also just really wanna recognize the resilience of the IP and public interest community um, that it, through so many walks of life and such a tough year, we've found really wonderful ways to come together and celebrate each other's work and you know, argue for waivers for vaccines and all the wonderful things um, that happen uh, at American and, and so many other places. Um, so today I wanna to talk to you about something that I think affects kind of all of us. Um, and it very much, uh, you are completely right, Peter, it uh, continues in the, uh, the thread of uh, Suzanne Harjo's uh, wonderful talk last year. Um, and, and this really focuses on the dynamics between advertising, racial injustice, um, and our commercial marketplace in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement. And um, I'm going to uh, share some slides with you. And, and before I do that, I just want to warn you that uh, some of the content, uh, given the topic that I'm going to be talking about, some of the content is um, unfortunately uh, offensive, and I apologize for that. Um, uh, Okay, um, so, so the topic that I'm gonna talk about today uh, is called uh, the commercial counter public. And I, I guess I just wanna foreground this talk with um, a really famous quote from Audre Lorde that I think you know, kind of sets the tone for uh, what I would really like us to think about um, uh, in, in the context of this talk. Um, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Um, oops, okay. So, uh, I want to start uh, on June 15th, 2020, when a video that was entitled How to Make a Non-Racist Breakfast goes viral. And uh, the video begins with a Black woman named Kirby who is about to make breakfast. And she sees a box of um, Aunt Jemima pancake mix uh, in her fridge. She says, Aunt Jemima. And then she shares with viewers a bit of history behind the brand, that a white man named Chris Rudd had come up with the name Aunt Jemima after attending a minstrel show, and that he even hired a former slave to impersonate Aunt Jemima, marking the first time that a living person was ever hired to impersonate an actual trademark. And she ended the video by dumping the pancake mix down the sink. And she says to the audience, Black Lives Matter people, 
even over breakfast. And this video was a sensation. It racked up hundreds of thousands of views and it ultimately helped change advertising history because two days after um, it went viral, the company that owned the trademark for Aunt Jemima, Quaker Oats, announced that the product would get a new name and image. And it detired, decided to retire the image, recognizing that, quote, Aunt Jemima's origins are based on a racial stereotype. And in a statement, Kirby responded by saying that she felt a sense of relief, knowing that my future children will not grow up in a world where their ancestors' oppression is insensitively used as a marketing tool on a box. I hope, she said, that other brands will follow suit. And the following week, other brands did just that. So almost overnight, it became immediately kind of unacceptable for longstanding racialized symbols to remain part and parcel of the public sphere. So in the weeks after the Aunt Jemima announcement, trademark owners of Aunt Uncle Ben's Rice, Mrs. Butterworth Syrup, Eskimo Pies, Darley, Cream of Wheat, all separately announced their intention to rebrand their images in the name of racial progress. And just a few weeks after that, um, and so you can see uh, what um, uh, Ben's Rice uh, said, you, there was also a really famous skit um, on SNL uh, where two people impersonated uh, Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima. Um, and then you have some examples of some of the brands um, that recently got rebranded. Again, apologies um, if, if this, um, for the insensitivity of the content. Um, and then things really culminated with uh, the, uh, the outright uh, sort of shift from a certain Washington team which uh, happens to be located in the school at which I'm speaking tonight, uh, facing grave threats from its sponsors, um, also agreed uh, to retire its name. Now, much can be made of these recent events, both politically, culturally, um, and commercially. And Bloomberg News uh, stated that uh, in the world of intellectual property, trademark rebranding for social justice purposes is quote, the most important trend we've seen in 2020 and is sure to continue. Now, at the same time that we celebrate the aftermath of these retirements, it's also important to pause to consider what the future holds for the branding and advertising landscapes that we now inhabit and the legal principles that govern this evolution. So in this talk, I wanna argue that these rebranding events in the summer of 2020 serve as a kind of legal prism for the future of the relationship between the political and commercial public sphere. So just as a prism divides light into constituent segments, the advent of racial rebranding or unbranding reveals to us the difference between the marketplace of goods and the marketplace of ideas. And in offering this theory, I draw on Cedric Robinson's groundbreaking theory of racial capitalism which was developed as well by Nancy Leong as the process of deriving social and economic value from the racial diversity um, of another person. And this tension, I would argue, threads into the way that we view the division between political and commercial speech. Because as long as we can remember, our constitutional frameworks have been governed by the marketplace of ideas metaphor. It courses through nearly every major theory animating the First Amendment's relationship to advertising. And perhaps most significantly, it has facilitated the law's distinction between commercial speech, which typically governs the marketplace of goods, and political speech, which governs the marketplace of ideas. Consequently, the law's protection of commercial speech has given rise to a host of trademark and advertising related regulations. Now, I should say that this work and this talk in general is, is drawn from work that I've been doing for a number of years now, actually way too many years now. And I think my book editor at Yale is listening. So I actually just really wanna thank him for his patience with this project over the last several years. Um, and I wanna point out that when I actually started this work, I was deeply concerned about trademark law's ability to censor freedom of, freedom of speech and expression. So much of the work that Peter trailblazed for so many of us. But thanks to the tireless work of scholars like Christine Farley, Rebecca Tushnet, Stacey Dogan, Vicki Phillips, Mark McKenna, Mark Lemley, and others, and particularly the work of trailblazing lawyers like Paul Levy, we've seen a real sea change. And this sea change now has meant that we are, it's fairly established 
that freedom of speech is balanced with trademark law or that trademark law is balanced by freedom of speech. But here, I would argue that the concern isn't that trademark law is squashing freedom of speech. It's that trademark law and branding is essentially cannibalizing dissent, right? Um, and so in this talk, I want to argue that the recent processes of trademark rebranding in the aftermath of recent events force us to normatively confront the transformation of the political and commercial spheres as a result. So why political speech and the contours of the First Amendment have a constitutional roadmap to address dissent, commercial speech has largely lacked any such ad architecture. And that is precisely the problem. This new dimension of rebranding in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement raises complex questions about the interplay between commercial and political speech. Here, politicized rebellion rightly unfolds across the advertising and branding landscapes. And brands in turn embrace the language of dissent in reconstituting themselves to be more inclusive. So dissent is now commodified, branded, and trademarked. But the question that I want to focus on is what this does to a world where political speech becomes commercialized and commercial speech becomes politicized. We're familiar with political dissent, but what do we do with commercial dissent? What do we do with commercial speech that masquerades as political speech or as counter public speech? And that's the problem that I want to focus on today. Now, in order for us to really understand um, why this transformation is so foundational for the future of advertising, we have to situate the origins of this transformation within the public sphere. And so in other words, in order to see where we've arrived, I think we have to grapple with the past. So the main idea for a counter public comes out of the work of philosopher Jürgen Habermas, who argued in his landmark book, The Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere, that the public sphere emerged from a system that empowered citizens to exercise distance from the state, in part through the rise of newspapers, salons, coffee houses, and other entities. And these practices produced kind of a reading public, the public of an emerging sphere of civil society. Now, while Habermas wrote about this initial emanation of the public sphere in glowing terms, in later years, his work expressed concern that it became harder and harder for the private sphere to limit the growth of state power. So while the powerful could easily distribute their views, it became harder and harder for marginalized voices to talk back. And here it is said that the core idea of a counter public is formed, in part by Habermas's central observation that some publics are defined by their tension with a larger public. Now, Habermas may have outlined the broad notion of a counter public, but the more specific idea of it comes from scholars Rita Felsky and Nancy Fraser, both who we see on, our, on their screen today. They both articulated the idea of a plurality of public spheres and a plurality of competing publics. And in Nancy Fraser's now famous account, she observes that if we think of public discourse as a single, comprehensive, overarching public, then members of subordinated minority groups have no arenas for deliberation amongst themselves. And so she famously wrote, members of subordinated social groups, women, workers, people of color, and gays and lesbians have repeatedly found it advantageous to constitute alternative publics. And so she defines the counter public as parallel discursive arenas where members of subordinated social groups invent and circulate counter discourses to formulate oppositional interpretation of their identities, their interests, and their needs. So as long as we've had the public sphere, a counter public sphere has, has arisen alongside. And both of, within both of these systems, language plays a powerful role, both in facilitating discrimination, but also in deflecting it as well. Now you may ask, okay, Professor Katyal, or um, maybe my kids would ask, uh, I know that they're watching downstairs at ages six and 10, and they're probably very excited about my discussion of trademark law since it comes up so often. How does this relate, you might ask, to the public interest and intellectual property? Two things that Peter Yazi, Christine Farley, Vicki Phillips, and my predecessors have spoken about. 
Well, I would argue that the concept of integrating property claims to counter publics through the process of trademarks and branding raises deep commerciality that the law is currently unable to address. Now, reading about counter public theory, it's pretty obvious that any scholar would be immediately struck by its deep and intrinsic similarities to the employment of self-appropriated slurs within political and commercial speech. Now, as I argue, and as others have argued as well, counterpublic marks collectively comprise a specific and understudied type of trademark, one that turns on the nexus between the mark, the identity of its owner, and the political expressive purpose behind the trademark itself. So you might ask, why suddenly today are these counterpublic trademarks so important? And here I think it's important to take a historical look at how trademarks have changed over time. As the nation's industrial economy grew, trademarks grew in importance. They culminated in a system of federal registration, enabling a triangular relationship between individual product and nation. But at the same time, at the same time, we also see the flourishing of racial branding. And racial branding essentially flourished during this era. And I wanna credit um, Anjali Vatz's excellent discussion of this in her book, where she points out how racial scripts have been used to demar demarcate people of color as objects for consumption instead of as equals. And within this system of racial capitalism, in white individuals become marked as producers and consumers and people of color become marked as objects of production and consumption. And yet, ironically, despite these conditions, Americans of all races have continued to think of themselves as consumer citizens and consumption becomes at cast as an act of patriotism as a result. So the culture embraces this neoliberal kind of individualized notion of entrepreneurship. And through this, the consumer and the citizen become united as a single entity. Now, although these trajectories were periodically disrupted by the onset of anti-consumption social movements, like adbusters, for example, even they adopt a paradoxical position that urges consumption as well. So you can see on their website that you can buy a pack of tools that <laughs> enable you to make yourself ready for the revolution. You can buy the corporate America flag. You can buy a black spot on Swisher. Now, this helps me, I think, to explain where we are today. And where we are today is that we embrace rather than we resist the marketplace, right? It sits uncomfortably between anti-consumerist models of the near past and more recent models of consumer sovereignty that have emerged. So today's consumer politics embrace rather than resist the marketplace. And <clears throat> as part of this belief system, the marketplace becomes the platform for our political imaginations, reformulating one's identities, rights, and ideologies as part and parcel of the logic of consumption and commodification. Now, as I argue here, counter public thought is really implicated in the form formation of these racialized trademarks. And this is something that I think, you know, a couple of trademark scholars have written about before me, Rosemary Kuhn, Fadi Ayun, right? That race is actually part of this process, that in the context of counter public trademarks, in, especially in today's age, consumer agency takes the form of a willingness to brand and trademark even things like slurs within our federal system of trademark enforcement. And so given that racial branding has constructed the marketplace of goods and advertising, it follows, and it follows almost too perfectly that even counter public speech draws on the same medium. And this view I think helps us to understand the new Supreme Court cases that have come out in the last few years. So the TAM case involved the question of whether an Asian American Portland rock group could trademark the name The Slants for their group. And Brunetti, right, uh, handed down a year later, involved the question of whether a streetwear clothing entrepreneur could trademark uh, the uh, term that uh, was an acronym for uh, friends you can't trust for a clothing line. 
Now, Simon Tan's famous case began because Tam discovered the existence of a non-Asian band by the same name and received reports that their fans were refused refunds when they discovered they bought tickets to the wrong show. So a lawyer advised Tam to file a trademark for the name The Slants to protect its name from further confusion. But their application kept getting denied because of this part of the Lanham Act, which uh, refused registration for immoral, deceptive, or scandalous matter, or matter that may disparage or falsely suggest a connection with, uh, with persons living or dead. Now, as we now know, Simon Tan went on to challenge Section 2 at the Supreme Court. And in a lesson, in an essay that later turned into a book-length memoir of his experiences, Tam explained, reappropriation is an effective way to create social change. It has a rich history steeped in oppressed communities who have used it as a way to address larger issues through irony, other times through taking on formally stigmatizing labels as badges of pride. Like other issues of identity politics, it's complex, it's nuanced, but it is something that has also baffled the USPTO, which has led to incredible inconsistent and subjective decisions. When communities co-opt terms for self-reference or self-empowerment, it's saying, you can't use that word against me. It belongs to me now. In that sense, refusing to be defined by others is an act of creation. It is both activism and art. Now, note the irony here. At the time that Tam, among others, celebrates the notion of a subcultural counterpublic recoding of a slur like slants, the band also seeks proprietary recognition from the most mainstream of entities, the PTO, right, the Patent and Trademark Office, in order to exclude others from using the term. So as Tam's observation suggested, while the imposition of a slur can be painful, the self-appropriation of the term slant as a response of the slur can be empowering. Yet the trademarking, the commodification of the slur, I think presents us with a complex paradox between identity and property. And this tension threads into political and commercial speech, and it lies, I think, at the heart of a trademark counterpublic. For when a trademark becomes registered, owned property, it empowers the trademark owner to exclude others from using the term. And this exclusionary tendency, I think, is really at the heart of the conflict between the two. Because when something is trademarked, it is no longer a figure of speech. It becomes an owned sovereign property capable of exclusion. And it raises the question about whether or not one registers a trademark before it has been successfully reclaimed or because it has been successfully reclaimed. And there's also another irony. And this irony I want to draw on from um, the author Viet Tham uh, Nguyen, who um, basically points out, Nguyen points out that the contemporary Asian American identity that has allowed Asian Americans to participate in American politics as an anti-capitalist force. And he observes how this has now become a thing, a commodity to be marketed and consumed. While Asian American political identity has enabled political resistance against racism and capitalist exploitation, Asian American cultural identity in the present moment furthers the aims of capitalism because Asian American cultural identity and Asian American lifestyle is both a commodity and a market at the same time. Now, the fact that Tam sought to protect all three, identity, commodity, and marketplace, I think produces the legal tensions that I want to talk about in this, in this uh, lecture, right? So when the court considered the point of whether or not uh, the, this sort of um, counterpublic trademark was commercial speech or political speech, it basically just refused to define it, right? And it concluded that it didn't need to resolve the debate or the question or the division between political speech or commercial speech because section two did not serve a substantial interest, nor was it narrowly drawn. And it rejected the idea that the government had an interest in preventing offensive speech. And it concluded the proudest boast of our free speech jurisprudence is that we hate, that is that we protect the freedom to express the thought we hate. 
Nor, the court continued, was it narrowly drawn to drive out trademarks that supported invidious discrimination, concluding, it is not an anti-discrimination clause, it is a happy talk clause. And the opinion concluded by noting the commercial market is well stocked with merchandise that disparages prominent figures and groups. And the line between commercial and non-commercial is not always clear. And if affixing the commercial label permits the suppression of any speech that can lead to political or social volatility, free speech would be endangered. And then uh, it followed up the TAM opinion with Brunetti, where the Supreme Court concluded that the ban on immoral and scandalous marks comprised unconstitutional discrimination based on viewpoint. And in its opinion, the court noted a bevy of the PTO's contradictory decisions. Why refuse to register bong hits for Jesus, but not Jesus died for you? Or refuse to register baby Al-Qaeda, but permit war on terror memorial? There are a great many immoral and scandalous ideas in the world, even more than there are swear words, Justice Kagan writes, and the Lanham Act covers them all. Now, as many scholars have pointed out, Brunetti failed to discuss whether or not to categorize trademarks as commercial speech. But as I would point out, the failure to clarify the boundaries between commercial and non-commercial speech has dramatic effects on the relationship between counterpublic formation, commerciality, and trademark property. So more normatively, while this talk may be among the first to kind of articulate the boundaries of a trademark counterpublic, the thing that I would like you to take away is that the advent of the trademark counterpublic is not necessarily something to celebrate because the law has failed to offer us a way to meaningfully distinguish a commercial counterpublic from a political one. And as empirical research shows, and here I really would encourage you to look at Vicki Huang's um, awesome new article that's coming out in the Illinois Law Review, uh, where she does an empirical look up at the post-TAM landscape. After these marks, after these cases, marks have been registered not for counterpublic purposes, but for a variety of other reasons that are hard to discern. Companies routinely engage in political speech and social movements commercialize their images by trademarking their names and slogans. Dissent is now commodified, branded, and trademarked. So only a few years after rock bands like The Slant support, seek Supreme Court protection for the racially oriented appropriation, Movements for Black Lives Matter and Occupy Wall Street face conflicts over whether or not to trademark their names altogether. And this, I would argue, creates a world that's really confusing. Political, political speech is becoming commercialized. Commercial speech is becoming politicized. And while we might want to celebrate the blending of the lines between commercial and political speech, it actually makes dissenting speech, that is true counter public speech, even harder to identify as a result. So as, as I would suggest, and as others have suggested, Tam and Brunetti have opened the door to a wide range of marks that are basically unimaginable in prior decades. And yet at the same time in the summer of 2020, the world grappled with an unprecedented opportunity to galvanize reform for racial justice as the Black Lives Matter movement unfolded across the country. So consider these two moments. One set of judicial decisions opens the door to an unlimited spectrum of branding from the most offensive to the most empowering. And another set of activist movements demand the empowerment of Black lives and visibility entailing the retirement of racist symbolism. And so remarkably within just a few months, a wide range of racially insensitive brands in 2020 announced a decision to rebrand themselves. But for trademark experts, there is something deeply paradoxical about using the power of intellectual property rights to do things like protecting minorities from slurs when our classic coterie of civil rights protections have failed to do the same thing. When we launder our desire for civil rights through the lens of the marketplace, Everything, even resistance, becomes commodified. And the marketplace of ideas becomes a background, a battleground of brands, trademarks, images, sardonic hashtags. And so even though the Supreme Court assures us that trademarks are private speech, there is an inescapable difference between private speech and a brand. Brands are much more than private speech. 
they are commodified commercial speech with public implications. And as the empirical evidence surrounding the aftermath of TAM suggests, many registrations are not self-appropriated at all, but rather appropriations of slurs that still have the potential to do significant damage. Here's my case in point. Not everyone celebrated Mattel versus TAM. Several years ago, just a few weeks after the opinion was handed down, and as the topic of our last lecture uh, spoke about, the US Department of Justice asked the Fourth Circuit to end a decades long Section 2 challenge to the name of the Washington DC football team. And that challenge had been percolating for decades, long before Simon Tan had even been born. But because of Tam, they had to end the case. Now, in my view, the Supreme Court, even as it attempted to harmonize trademark law with the First Amendment, produced a curious irony. Just as it empowered individuals like Simon Tam to reclaim and reappropriate derogatory terms, it now extends the same protection to the most entrepreneurial of haters as well. And so um, just to kind of uh, outline some of this, I just wanna draw on uh, Vicki Huang's uh, just amazing empirical work on this, where she points out that there's like a bunch of different kinds of marks that have been registered after Tam. It's a small number, but it's important to note that marks that these marks are not all self appropriations after TAM. The first category of marks um, can, that now can be registered are the ones that would fall into TAM's context, self appropriated marks. And the second category of marks are marks that, that are disparaging, but not the products of self appropriation. And the third category are marks that are registered not for the purposes of self appropriation or disparagement but to prevent others from using the term. And so in this slide, I just wanna kind of just give you a moment to just look at these registrations. Um, these are all the registrations that have been uh, issued uh, and applied for after TAM. So you see a number of the most kind of hateful uh, terms that have been used against minorities to be registered. And it is true that some entrepreneurs are doing it for self-appropriation reasons, like Mike Lynn, who claims that he filed an application for uh, the terms that you see in order to take back the slur. But at the same time, you can see that he also sought to register uh, um, uh, the term fear the hijab, right? Which is not a self-appropriation uh, sort of inclination that he might share. Um, someone even uh, filed an application for a swastika and, uh, and then explained that uh, they plan to do that uh, to prevent others from using the mark. So they're trying to prevent others from using the mark, but at the same time, in order to keep the mark, they have to sell products with the mark. So um, the individual who registered the swastika said, if you wanna buy the swastika flag, you have to buy it through us, and it's gonna be $1,000 each. So, as you can see, this is really not the win for marginalized groups that Tam uh, promised us. It becomes more and more difficult to tell the difference between a group who wants to reclaim a mark as an offensive slur, like Simon Tan, to change its social meaning, and those who just want to offend. And trademark law doesn't recognize a difference. And if trademark law doesn't recognize the difference, then neither will we. And so I want to kind of just, uh, you know, and we're coming to the end of my talk, but I want to just end with a couple of examples of uh, things that I see of, as, as deep areas of concern. So you see that there's a number of different retirements that you see on this screen. Uh, you have uh, uh, Quaker Oats, cream, cream of Wheat, the musical band, the Dixie Chicks, right? Um, and then the Washington team. But there is this sort of hidden irony. And the hidden irony is that just after the announcements were made to retire certain brands, days later, another entity came along to register some of those very same marks, Aunt Jemima, Eskimo Pie, the, um, uh, the previous name of the Washington team, and Uncle Ben as trademarks. And the registering company Retro Brands said that the brands soon to be abandoned were free for the taking and actually argued that these brands have been sufficiently updated, they have big markets, they include black customers who agree that the brands are no longer derogatory. So what to make of these moments kind of in branding history, right? And this brings us um, to uh, the fundamental question that I think this talk raises, which is 
what is counter about counter publics, right? When they function as trademark entities and commercial speech. So when the lines between political and commercial speech become blurred, right? Corporations wind up becoming consumers and corporations essentially become persons in the process. And uh, this creates a little bit of confusion because when corporations use political speech, they are arguing that they're deserving of the same kind of protection that everyone else enjoys, right? And the law seems to kind of vacillate. Um, and I think that things become quite murky in terms of figuring out whether or not they are the same types of speakers as political speakers. And the Supreme Court, I think, uh, has suggested that the line between commercial and political speech is rapidly disappearing in Tam and Brunetti. But I would argue that the disappearance of that line really raises these complex questions of whether or not commercial speech does deserve less protection under the First Amendment, whether or not commercial entities can enunciate political speech in the same way as other speakers, and whether political entities can enunciate commercial speech. And I would argue that the consumer notes a difference in commercial versus political speech, even if the law does not. And when these kinds of terms function as property, they retain the capacity to exclude others from using the term. And that's precisely the problem. Now, if these sort of observations seem really abstract, let me give you this example. Um, in October of 2017, a cosmetic company named Hard Candy, Hard Candy filed an application to register the hashtag MeToo. And it filed it five days after it tre started trending on social media. And if it was granted, it would have empowered the company to claim an exclusive right to use the term. Now, this is exactly the problem. The problem here, right, is that when companies can have the ability to register terms that are counter public terms or terms that have political significance, there is a risk that the rise of this kind of corporate branding makes social movements more commodified than others, right? Social entrepreneurship increases access and exposure to social issues, but it also winds up cluttering the market for social movements. And in a world where the PTO can essentially decide who receives property rights and such slogans, the risk of these subjective determinations that the PTO enjoys means that companies can receive the rights to brand their products with the names of important social movements like Me Too. And the result of this, I think, both cheapens and commodifies the value of political speech um, as a result. And so, as I want to kind of end our talk today, I just want to suggest that this talk, you know, isn't really about kind of the possibilities of law to discuss or to address these deep longstanding social issues, but rather it's about the risks of us equating political and commercial speech. It's about the risks that flow from cases like Tam and Brunetti. And it's about the risks of being in a country like the United States that has a very strong tradition of supporting freedom of expression, often at the cost of minority rights. Now, more empirical research, um, I think is needed about the effects of Tam and Brunetti and more analysis beyond the kind of anecdotal evidence that I've offered here is needed. But I think one thing becomes clear in the wake of Tam and Brunetti, counter public marks, whether they're appropriated or whether they're self-appropriated, amounts to big business. And that is the problem. And as I've suggested, while Tam and Brunetti give rise to a multiplicity of registrations, the outcome is far different. It's far different than the win for marginalized groups that Tam predicted. And the result of this commodification of the counter public as I've suggested, can actually risk perpetuating certain kinds of harms in the end. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, and I'd love, to, uh, I'd love to discuss some of the ideas uh, uh, with you. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, Sonia, that was terrific. Congratulations. That was uh, well done. Uh, really, really powerful, very accessible. Um, even though you did mention Habermas. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I did. I did go to Brown University. I had to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, and I think you've really put your finger on a, a hard problem. And and your point about, on the one hand, it's you know, it it's the brand. It's the the arguments about the brands that are doing civil rights work, but then <laughs> are, are they really as great? So my job isn't to chat. My job at this point <laughs> is to uh, moderate the Q and A. Um, so I'm looking. So Yvette jumped in, but mostly initially to talk to just share uh, details about an article on this topic that she has just published. Awesome. Um, uh, um, uh, and I guess, um, so one question is, is um, uh, this, you know, the, Brunetti and Tam were all about just the right to obtain a federal trademark registration. No, none of this was about your right to use these offensive marks in, in commerce. So what, are, in your telling, what's the role of the unregistered marks? Um, uh, and and are they equally contested, or or do they present a different prob set of problems? Yeah, um, that's a that's a really <laughs> that's a really good question. I mean, I think the way that I so I think the reason why I'm pretty concerned about kind of the next sort of era that we're moving into is um, it flows from what I and all of us, many of us here in the United States have been raised with, which is this kind of central division between political speech and commercial speech, where we treat them differently. And, uh, you know, I think that unregistered marks, um, you know, it, it, if we think about it through the lens of the consumer, I think that it may not necessarily matter to the consumer whether the marks are registered or not. The fact that they can be enforced um, and the fact that they are functioning as commercial speech, I think raises the same kinds of concerns that justify the division that we've seen in the past between political and commercial speech. And so I'd be concerned about a world where consumers can't tell the difference between uh, you know, branded political speech, right? Um, and political speech that is not branded. Um, and, I, and, I, and I'm concerned about that um, because, you know, steeped in the language of trademark law is a real desire to protect the consumer. And I think that there, it raises so many questions of harming consumers, both through the lens of kind of racial harms, but also through the lens of, of confusion-based harms, right? I mean, think about what might have happened if Hard Candy had successfully been able to trademark Me Too, right? Um, and in and it's not a you know ridiculous kind of concern, even though we do have doctrines that are supposed to prevent it. You know, there's a whole landscape of PTO determinations that are highly subjective. So I, I think I would be concerned about things through the lens of what the consumer sees. Great, thank you. Um, so in the queue, um, Austin's got a trademark question, and then Peter has a copyright. Uh, question because the two bodies of law speak to each other. But awesome. Austin asks, uh, when addressing Huang's um, second category, appropriated marks, would it be possible for marginalized groups to claim a Section 2A claim of falsely suggesting a connection to a national symbol when referring to symbols or likenesses of people or groups? Is, is there any room or standing to use that as an avenue? Yeah, I mean, this is such a great question. Um, there, there is so little case law on that provision relative to the others in Section 2A. But I think that, um, you know, particularly when we think about the concerns um, that many Indigenous groups have um, about, about marks, and uh, I think that that is exactly the kind of prong that, that we should think about kind of using for those kinds of ends. Um, and I, I, I do just want to say that, um, you know, Angela Riley and I and uh, Rachel Lim, who um, uh, is uh, a grad student at Berkeley, um, we are doing this massive project where we are basically combing through the PTO for indigenously identified terms and then trying to research where the ownership resides precisely for the purposes of, of hopefully creating some groundwork to do that sort of very, very important work that I see as part of the cultural property responsibilities that we all have. Very interesting. Um, Peter. Thank you. It was a wonderful talk. Um, I, it, 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 very challenging. Um, 
very pertinently, although disturbingly illustrated and powerful. So thank you very much for that. And I, I, I hesitate to interrupt the trademark discussion, which is very rich and from which I can learn a lot, but I do have a question about copyright implications of, of the argument. So as we all know, for a long time, we, we got along in copyright law without having any clear doctrinal connection between fair use and the First Amendment. And then, you know, with, with one thing and another, that changed. And suddenly the Supreme Court, maybe to get itself out of a spot that it, it didn't, didn't like being in, decided that after all, this, this doctrine had been about freedom of speech all along. Who knew? But anyway, and then we sort of, we, we've, been, we've been working with that for 25 years or so, somewhat successfully in the sense that it hasn't, it hasn't done any harm to have, to be able to claim that the sort of, the sort of First Amendment issue is pushing behind the fair use doctrine. And I worry a little bit that if we clarify the distinction between commercial and, and, and political speech, we might, there might be an inadvertent effect which is to take some of the, to say some of the sort of free speech steam out of, of the, whatever we want to call it, the, you know, the fair use renaissance or, or whatever name we give it on the copyright side. Because after all, I mean, most of the stuff that, that we are dealing with in, you know, you know a book, is, an, is a thing in commerce, a movie is a thing in commerce. Um, if, 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 we make, if we make the line too clear, I worry that we, we, we create an opening, a, a, a crack, a kind of a fissure in the, in the fair use powered, excuse me, in the first amendment powered fair use doctrine that has been has been developing so nicely for the last quarter century. I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but no, I, I, it it totally makes sense, Peter. And uh, if you if you didn't raise that question, I would feel I was feel I would feel as if I failed at this lecture in some way, <laughs> given the fact that so much of what we enjoy in the landscape of freedom of speech is attributable to the kinds of things that you've made us all think about, right? I mean, it is because of you and the work of so many others that I think the boundaries of fair use are well established and embraced. Now, I want to respond to your question by actually suggesting something that I'm pretty sure the Supreme Court might disagree with, right? But it is something that I, you know, I feel very strongly about. And I have to say, I mean, I'm really inspired by uh, Rebecca Tushnet and Christine Farley's work on this. Um, I do believe that the boundaries of commercial speech uh, create kind of a different lens for us to think about in terms of the world of trademarks. And I think that a lot of that comes from our responsibility, or at least what I see as the government's responsibility to protect the public from unfair, discriminatory, mm -hmm. um, you know, potentially fraudulent advertising and brands. And so for me, you know, when I think of sponsorship, I take a really broad view of, of what sponsorship means. And I know that that is against the grain of, you know, what the Supreme Court said in Tam and Brunetti. Um, where it classified trademarks as private speech. I wholly disagree with that. I do not think that trademarks are private speech. I think that trademarks have so many aspects of them that are kind of imbricated with government enforcement. And so in that sense, I think the public can draw a clear line between brands and, uh, and, and something that is copyrighted, right? Um, and, you know, we don't associate uh, you know, Dune, for example, with uh, government 
speech or responsibility, but we would be concerned about something that we're confusing regarding that brand, Dune, right? And we would look to the government to help us enforce any boundaries of confusion. So that's kind of where my impetus comes from. It truly is from, you know, that really basic kind of distinction between political and commercial speech. And I know that I'm, you know, I'm not going to be on the Supreme Court anytime soon to, you know, push or enforce that boundary. Um, but, you know, who knows, maybe the next generation of Supreme Court uh, justices might, might, might reinvigorate that division. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank Great. You. Um, and Rebecca, I don't know if we can hear you or if uh, you may have to type your question uh, in the chat. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, we can. Great. Hi. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, this is really great. I just want to uh, raise one question. Sorry, my game playing son is uh, uh, harassing me in the background. Uh, but uh, so you started with the Audrey Lord quotation, and uh, I just want to push you uh, on that a little bit because, uh, you know, a lot of times my reaction is, you know, that's, you know, that's often true, but have you tried taking down the master's house without the master's tools, it doesn't work so well either, right? Uh, and uh, so, and let me just propose one thing that is reasonably de described as one of the master's tools, but I think is actually being used quite aggressively uh, in some of the ways that uh, you might support, which is failure to function, right? Yeah. So, uh, and the PTO, of course, is going to be inconsistent. You know, it gets half a million applications, right? Uh, there is, nobody could be consistent about that. Um, but failure to function, they're using pretty aggressively in ways that actually fit very well with the idea that something overridingly communicates something else than branding. And yeah. I think actually there's some room for theorizing how, uh, you know, a normative commitment to that uh, could work, right? So that if we're committed to uh, the 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 social meaning and having the social meaning of something change in ways uh, that aren't you know branded. Uh, I think there's real room there. So I just want to push you a little on that. No, I love uh, Rebecca. Thank you so much for raising failure to function. I uh, I'm I'm glad I'm glad that you did raise it. Um, I I think that failure to function does have a huge amount of potential um, in kind of pulling back the scope of. Uh, social movements that are being kind of branded by corporations. Um, I don't think, I don't know how much failure to function would do in terms of work where, I mean, I, I think failure to function would do a lot in terms of the hard candy example of um, trademarking Me Too or some of the issues that might come associated with trademarking Black Lives Matter. Um, but I, I, I do think that the results, at least, um, you know, I've read a a really awesome paper um, by Tori Ekstrand on, on um, uh, Black Lives Matter and the trademarking of Black Lives Matter. And the evidence actually was really interesting. It showed that, you know, the PTO kind of overwhelmingly rejected uh, trademarking Black Lives Matter on a failure to function basis, but then allowed like a bunch of other lives matters, right? So like Christian lives matters and Irish lives matters and like a bunch of others. In fact, um, if, if you want, I can, I even have a slide about this um, that I can show you. Actually, let me just show it to you. Hang on. Let me see if I can get it. Um, yeah. Okay. So here we go. Uh, and I, I just want to say that, that, that your failure to function question was not a product placement plant by any way. I just figured that it would, I was, I just didn't have time to talk about it. So I had this extra slide, but you can see some of the ones that made it through, right? Elderly lives matter, badge lives matter, fat lives matter, bike lives matter, mutt lives matter. And the, the observation that I think is just really interesting here is that it is interesting that all of these get through, right? Um, but black lives matter does not. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that raises real questions. Um, and I, you know, and I have to come, I have to say that I, you know, am of a bunch of different minds of that. Um, I believe that you're right, that failure to function is an area that we have not really looked at in terms of being able to figure out how to pull back the kind of expansive branding trend that we're seeing. Um, but the sorry, can I just, uh, 
can we just clarify for everybody? It means failure to function as Mark, right? Yes. Just to, sorry, this is a little bit of inside trademark baseball, and we have a broader audience. So. Thank you. Thank you for that, Michael. Yes. So the the idea behind the failure to function doctrine is that if a mark fails to function as a mark because it either communicates information or because it's a term of speech that is, uh, you know, part of the kind of essentially the language of the public domain, it should not be viewed as a trademark. Now, as you can see in the Me Too example, the application to trademark was fi was filed only five days after the term started trending on social media. So I think the point about worrying about the PTO's subjectivity here still has validity, but I also agree with you, Rebecca. I think, you know, this is not meant to be like a deeply pessimistic talk. It is also meant to suggest that um, there, there may be some areas where trademark laws doctrines can kind of pull back this sort of cannibalizing trend that I'm concerned about. Great. So I think we have time for just a couple more. Um, there is one in the, the in the chat about um, sort of parodies that are that have been held to to uh, <clears throat> have been a non commercial They might be uh, protectable under the un as a mark, but then also be deemed to be making a non commercial use in dilution law. And I'm I guess the question is, is there a place in your framework for how the law thinks about that? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and yes, it is It is definitely true that uh, the boundaries of non-commerciality have really been broadened in order to protect kind of the speech elements of parody and kind of making fun of different brands. Uh, Mark Lemley and Stacey Dogan have a wonderful piece about parody as brand um, that I think really does a nice job of capturing this. The concern that I have um, is not so much about the expansion of the protection for non-commercial speech. It's really about the fact that, um, that so many political movements are oriented towards exactly the opposite pole, which is the pole of commodification, the pole of branding. And the reason that that concerns me is because it makes the playing field such that if you want to play in the language of social movements, you have to think about it in terms of the same way that we might think about branding and advertising. And when you introduce trademark protection into that dynamic, I think that it risks sort of overvaluing commodification over the kind of political value um, that we might associate with the brand or the moniker. And that's the concern that I have. Um, and, and I think that this is a concern that we see, you know, in this landscape that we live in today, that, you know, every social movement that we're seeing now becomes part of the language of brands, whether it's arguing for the retirement of brands or the introduction of new brands, everything becomes part of the marketplace. And as a result, it becomes really hard to build true dissent when everything is through the language of commodification. Great, thanks. Um, so Christine had a, a up, up top, she, Christine had a question, so go ahead. I have a hundred questions. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I wanna ask questions, but I just wanna uh, like make up a, a few placeholders for things that I would love to have time to talk to you about another time. Um, one is I wonder if you thought about how the, the difference in appreciation for the downsides of the route that the Supreme Court was taking. Um, if you have thoughts about why that so belatedly occurred to a couple of justices, um, namely Justice Sotomayor and, and um, um, Alito. Well, you know, <laughs> to some extent Alito, but, but Breyer as well, you know, yeah. like why, why did they not, were they so captivated by Tam's story, or you know, if you have some other idea about that. Um, also, you, you didn't mention um, this other trend, which has nothing to do with um, racialized trademarks or um, you know, a dissent speech, but does have to do with speech and trademark. Is this other trend of you know the 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 vitality of the um, Rogers versus Grimaldi, um, def, you know, defense 
of um, the use of trademarks against uh, trademark owners and how that's become so um, such a pop popular route to go, which I, I think has a place in what you're talking about in terms of you know everything speech and uh, everything is also branded and somehow we have to you know we have to we have to make space. But the, what I'd really like to ask you about is um, whether there's been a change, I guess, I don't know how to say this in a, in a more nuanced way, but, but has, has capitalism become more sophisticated? Um, so I think you've written elsewhere about the uh, Pink Panther Brigade case in the Second Circuit from, from I don't know when, which is trademark owner gets to absolutely you know, beat a dissenting speaker with their trademark totally successfully, right? That was a likelihood of confusion. You win on every single uh, factor. Um, and that's not what we see anymore. What we see now is more uh, a co-opting of dissent, right? Yeah. Of, 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 you know, bringing it all into the branded world and not seeing the separation between the two. And just to give you a couple of, a, a few more examples of this, so I'm glad, I'm really glad that you're doing this project on looking at the USPTO database. It's always such a wealth of really interesting yeah. information. Um, and I hope you're looking at designs as well as word marks. Absolutely. Because, like just this little example, which is, you know, there are design codes that, that the trademark office uses to search and categorize applications. And there's a design code for Indian man, and that's yes. what it's called, Indian man, you know? And so just the idea of, of you know, the, the commoditization of race, you know, is just so embedded in how the system works. And another example is, so you, you talked about just this rapid development um, that, that took place over Aunt Jemima in particular first, right? That was the first yeah. trademark to fall. So the video goes viral, Aunt Jemima, the company responds with a big, you know, public mea culpa. We are so with the movement and the program. Yes, you know, we've, we, you know, the veil has been lifted. We now see the error of our ways. That was on June 17th. On July 1st, they, they produced a specimen of use in a design mark for, for um, Aunt Jemima of the image of Aunt Jemima. So while they're, you know, kind of using marketing of, you know, we support the dissent, we're with Black Lives Matters, they're still somehow pursuing the trademark at the same time. You know, so it, it just feels like there's been just, you know, they've just, so the, so the idea is not the um, MGM beat the dissenters with the trademark. Yeah. Um, you know, we had this idea um, before in starting out speech of use other than as a mark. Right, but that is like that's like and kind of an antiquated concept of use other than as a mark, as if that speech, right? Because use of a mark is speech. You use of you know the mark. So anyway, I could I could go on and on. I say, but wonderful talk. Thank you so much, Sonia. Oh wow! I mean, these comments are just so fantastic. I don't think I can do justice to all of them. Uh, I am aware of the design codes, and uh, it's kind of an yeah. It's it's actually the thing that we were the most horrified by, to be honest with you. Um, uh, I think the point you make about Rogers versus Grimaldi. Uh, apologies for the inside baseball of that uh, question. Um, yes, totally right on. Um, I need to do more thinking about that. Um, now, the question that I I guess might be helpful to end with is this question about like. Um, how is it that the Supreme Court came out the way that it did, um, given their, you know, the commitment of many people to, uh, you know, um, on the Supreme Court, not many, but at least some people uh, to thinking about um, uh, equality uh, for minorities. Um, and, uh, and I guess the answer that I can come up with um, for you, uh, having no kind of inside knowledge of what was going on, is, um, is that I actually think that um, there was a real failure on this. I, I think that there's such a, a sort of 
trend that we're seeing in this world where like there's a real kind of sanctity that's associated with the First Amendment. And I think that it has led us, our concerns for protecting political speech have led us to a world where we're not really thinking about the central Hudson reasons for why we had this division between commercial and political speech, which was really to protect the consumer. Um, and I think the problem with that is that we, we need to tell stories, right, about how individuals are harmed or confused by this expansion of branding into this world. And I suspect that this generation of new brands will do that, right? I mean, I think if you look at Vicki Fang's article in the Illinois Law Review, um, you, you know, your eyes will open to see the kind of things that people are thinking about trademarking. And that may lead us to a place where we start thinking about a more robust form of consumer protection, ones that thinks about exposure to children or other kinds of things. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not fully on board with that without keeping in mind the importance of supporting a diverse community, particularly like the LGBT community, which I think is always the first community to be sort of uh, penalized at the MGA Panther's case is a good example of that. Um, but, but I also do think that um, there, you know, there is room for us to be more expansive. And there, frankly, was room for the Supreme Court to have a much more narrow ruling, right? It could have found that it was vague, um, just, you know, it, it didn't have to overturn the whole thing. Um, and, uh, you know, and that this is the world that we live in. We need better lawyers. Um, we need, uh, you know, and, and we need, I think we need people who really understand kind of the boundaries between political and commercial speech. But I sometimes think that our commitment to the marketplace is so concrete and so broad that it makes it hard for us to understand why that difference really matters. Um, and that's, that's uh, a really powerful note on which we should end our formal uh, discussion. Um, uh, and I want to thank all the participants uh, uh, who who hung in there for an hour and a half of Zoom. We we do understand after having done it for almost two years what that what that takes. And uh, Sonia, it's a, just a tribute to to the magnetism of your uh, topic and your presentation that you've been able to hold the audience like this. So uh, thank you so much. I'm sorry there were a couple of questions that we just didn't get to. Um, obviously, email. Uh, is a way to follow up with Sonia, um, and uh, you know, I expect this. This is clearly an ongoing project, so there will be other times to engage with you on this. Um, but uh, I think um, Christine, Peter, any last words before we sort of uh, uh, sign off? Well, I just want to thank you, Sonia. That I can't believe that that time flew by so quickly. I was enraptured and uh, really, uh, really. Um, angered in the right way and uh, <laughs> and provoked in the right way. So so thanks for that. Well, uh, your work did the same for me. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. You're here. <laughs>